Welcome everyone to this PowerPoint video presentation series. This series will be a verse-by-verse -verse exposition on Daniel chapter 11. Today's presentation is a preliminary that will be given on this chapter before we start getting into each individual verse. But before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with. And we come before you, Lord, to just ask for forgiveness of any unrighteousness, any sin that may be in our life, whether it be known or hidden. We ask that you be with us now. We ask for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to give us understanding of what we're about to read. Please send your holy angels to protect and guide us to keep the internet from going offline, to keep our computers working, that we may view this presentation. Please put it in the hearts of each and every individual that watches this, that they go and study for themselves and look up every quote and every verse that is provided. We ask that you be with us now. Please send your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and understanding as you promised if we ask. Through the blood of your Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. We are counseled. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied. And in connection with them, the words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Evangelism 196, paragraph 2. The things revealed to Daniel were afterward complemented by the revelation made to John on the Isle of Patmos. These two books should be carefully studied. Testimonies to Ministers. There is great need to search the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and learn the text thoroughly that we may know what is written. Many of our people understand chapter 2, chapter uh, 7 and 8. Well, some don't even understand 8. But a lot of people really don't understand chapter 11. So this is why we're going to be doing a verse-by-verse -verse exposition on this chapter. How are we to study these prophecies? You can form a Bible class and search the scriptures for yourselves with the aid of our publications, and in this way learn much of present truth. Note: In order to be in present truth, we must search the scriptures not by themselves, but with the aid of our publications. And you can go to Councils to Writers and ed Editors, page 32, paragraph 1. The publications equal our books and periodicals. The world is to receive the light of truth in our books and periodicals. Our publications are to show that the end of all things is at hand. Christian Service, page 146. Canvassers should call the attention of those they visit to our publications, telling them of the valuable instruction these periodicals contain. Christian Service, page 152, paragraph 3. So our periodicals are referred to as publications. Which periodicals are we specifically counseled to read? Early Workers to Speak. God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. How? Their work shall follow them. We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. They move forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God one by one these pioneers are passing away. The word given me is let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. 
and let's look at one of these men she's referring to. Not long ago, next paragraph, I took up a copy of the Bible Echo. As I looked it through, I saw an article by Elder Haskell and one by Elder Corliss. As I laid the paper down, I said these articles must be reproduced. There is truth and power in them. Men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Councils to Writers and Editors, page 28, paragraph 2. According to the prophet, Elder Haskell, when he wrote these articles, he was being moved by the Holy Spirit as he was speaking and writing. There's another quote where she says that his books are to be read, that her counselor, capital C, referring to Christ, showed her his books were to be sold and read. He has four books. The Bible Handbook, the cross in its shadow on the sanctuary story of Daniel the prophet on the book of Daniel and story of the seer of Patmos on the book of Revelation we know and Elder Haskell and Elder Loughborough know also of the earlier history of this work there are few now alive who pass through the experience of 1843 in 1844. So in 1906, and if you read the previous paragraph, paragraph one, go to the reference, you will see that she says Elder Haskell and Loughborough in 1906 knew all of our truths. What else are we told? The record of the experience through which the people of God passed in the early history of our work must be republished. Many of those who have since come into the truth are ignorant of the way in which the Lord wrought. The experience of William Miller and his associates, of Captain Joseph Bates, and of other pioneers in the Advent message should be kept before our people. Elder Loughborough's book should receive attention. Our leading men should see what can be done for the circulation of this book. This book is none other than the Great Second Advent Movement, written by Loughborough. If you go to Great Second Advent Movement, pages 124 to 125, you'll see who some of Miller's associates were. A few are still alive who pass through the experience gained in the establishment of this truth. God has graciously spared their lives to repeat and repeat till the close of their lives the experience through which they passed, even as did John the Apostle till the very close of his life. And the standard bearers who have fallen in death are to speak through the reprinting of their writings. Now, brothers and sisters, pay very close attention to these next two sentences because this is very crucial. I am instructed that thus their voices are to be heard. They are to bear their testimony as to what constitutes the truth for this time. Councils to writers and editors. Many people say we don't need to go by what the pioneers wrote. But according to the prophet, they are to bear the testimony as to what constitutes the truth for this time. Now it is true, not a single one of these men were, th were without error. But when they were in agreement on a subject that the prophet endorsed, and she points to certain books of theirs, we can trust these men. We can trust these particular topics or subjects or books that she points us to. Many say that today, in today's day, we have more light and it's what we teach, not what the pioneers teach. But according to the prophet, and remember to the law and to the testimony, these men who have fallen in death, we are to reprint their writings and their writings are to bear testimony as to what constitutes the truth for this time. But it is very important that we study the spirit of prophecy so we know what she's endorsed and what she says is error. We 
we are not to receive the words of those who come with a message that contradicts the special points of our faith. They gather together a mass of scripture and pile it as proof around their asserted theories. This has been done over and over again during the past 50 years. And in other quotes she says 50 plus years. And while the scriptures are God's word, so let's pay attention to this wording. While the scriptures are God's word and are to be respected, the application of them, if such application moves one pillar from the foundation that God has sustained these 50 years, is a great mistake. And that's counsels to writers and editors. She wrote that in 1905. Brothers and sisters, we're to read Miller and, and his associates and other pioneers such as Haskell and Loughborough and other men we're going to be reading about. But even their writings, people will take stuff out of context. They will try to use Miller's writings to substantiate their position. But if you continue to read what Miller wrote, where they put the dot 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 or leave off the rest you will see Miller is not endorsing the very thing which they are trying to support so make sure you read if anyone gives you a quote and myself I do dot 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 like in this quote and that's just to shorten it to get to the gist of the quote but go back and study these things for yourselves what other books are we counseled to read? I refuse to go into an argument with those who oppose the truth, but call their attention to the publication of the truth given me, which has been written under the Holy Spirit's representation. If they will carefully read Great Controversy, the Testimonies for the Church, Patriarchs and Prophets, Desire of Ages, and all the many books that are in circulation, that bear testimony to the truth given at very times and in very places over a period of half a century they would not be entering into temptation and walking in false paths where there some are today now the reason she's saying over a period of half a century a half a century is fifty years it was in the eighteen fifties the publication work for seventh-day adventists started but our messages were being preached prior to that. In 21 Manuscript Release 437, paragraph 1, she says all the messages given from 1840 to 44. Let's continue on. And this quote is only found on the new Ellen G. White uh, releases at egwwritings.org. That's egw and then w-r-i-t-i-n-g-s. Dot o -R -G. The truth for this time has been brought out in many books. Remember, she says, her writings plus all the many books that have been in circulation over the last 50 plus years. Let those who have been dealing in cheap sentiments and foolish tests cease this work and study Daniel and the Revelation. They will then have something to talk about that will help the mind as they receive excuse me as they receive the knowledge contained in this book they will have in the treasure house of the mind a store from which they can essentially draw as they communicate to others the great essential truths of God's Word so the great essential truths of God's Word are found in this book Daniel the Revelation but we're going to find out which edition, brothers and sisters, because there's many false editions going out there, and we'll be going more into that in just a moment. The interest in Daniel and the Revelation is to continue as long as probationary time shall last. God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light. So notice, she doesn't say he's writing darkness and error. God used the author of this book, who's none other than Uriah Smith. And we'll be reading, does he have major mistakes in this book, as many claim? We're going to see what does a thus saith the Lord say through the testimony of Jesus. God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light. 
to direct minds to the truth. Shall we not appreciate this light, which points us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King? So, what this author wrote in this book gives us the signs that points us up to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King. And first manuscript release... Satan will seek to divert the minds of those who should be established, strengthened, and settled in the truths of the first, second, and third angel's messages. The students in our schools should carefully study Daniel and the Revelation so that they shall not be left in darkness and the day of Christ overtake them as a thief in the night. Now what subject is thief in the night dealing with? It's dealing with... Christ's second coming, the signs that lead up to it. We're supposed to study this book called Daniel the Revelation so that Christ doesn't appear to us as a thief in the night. She goes on to say, I speak of this book because it is a means of educating those who need to understand the truth of the word, and that's all of us. This book should be not only appreciated, but highly appreciated. It covers much of the ground we have been over in our experience. If the youth will study this book and learn for themselves what is truth, they will be saved from many perils. Brothers and sisters, notice how she starts off saying, we should be established, strengthened, and settled in the truths of the first, second, and third angel's messages. That Satan will seek to divert our minds from these messages then she says we need to study this book if you want to know the three angels messages you need to study this book and I'm telling you I'm learning the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation like never before from studying this book but once again we want to make sure we are studying the correct edition and we'll be getting into that more in the near future of this presentation um, 1MR, it's first manuscript releases. The very same Satan is at work to undermine the faith of the people of God at this time. There are persons ready to catch up every new idea. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation are misinterpreted. These persons do not consider that the truth has been set forth at the appointed time by the very men whom God was leading to do this special work. And we learned that it was Uriah Smith, he's the author that God used to give us an understanding of these prophecies in the book Daniel the Revelation. She goes on to say those who have not had a personal experience in this work are to take the word of God and believe on their word. Those pioneers whose writings she said were to be repeated who have been led by the Lord in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. If we search the scriptures to confirm the truth God has given his servants for the world, we shall be found proclaiming the first, second, and third angel's messages, second selected messages. Brothers and sisters, let's go back and look at these last, this last sentence. How are we supposed to search the scriptures? She says, if we search the scriptures to confirm the truth God has given his servants, we shall be found proclaiming the first, second, and third angel's messages. Brothers and sisters, we're not to go and search the scriptures to contradict that which has already been established. We are to search the scriptures to confirm the truth has already been given to us in our publications, in our books and periodicals. Let's keep going. Especially should the book, Daniel and the Revelation, be brought before the people as the very book for this time. This book contains the message which all need to read and understand. By reading it, many souls have come to a knowledge of the truth. Those who are preparing to enter the ministry who desire to become successful students of the prophecies will find Daniel and the Revelation an invaluable help. They need to understand this book. It speaks of past, 
present and future, laying out the path so plainly that none need err therein. Brothers and sisters, the truths of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and the three angels' messages have been laid out so plainly in this book that none of us need err therein. We don't have to worry about being in error. We don't have to be worry about being in darkness. This book will prevent us from being in darkness. But remember which edition, because the false editions are leading our people into darkness. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for the cheap sentiments presented by those who have a burning desire to get out something new and strange to present to the flock of God. The great essential questions which God would have presented to the people are found in Daniel and the Revelation. Remember the great essential questions. Remember that. We're going to talk about a particular question subject that has been removed from Uriah's book that God wants back, and it is in the correct editions. There is found solid eternal truth for this time. Everyone needs the light and information it contains. So that's everyone, from the youth in the schools, to the evangelist and the minister in the pulpit, to the student and the lay people sitting in the audience, the teachers, the Sabbath school teachers, the Adventist school teachers, anyone who's teaching, anyone who's studying, which should be all of us. Everyone needs the light and information this book contains. The grand instruction contained in Daniel and Revelation has been the means of bringing many precious souls to a knowledge of the truth. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. 21 Manuscript Release Brothers and sisters, this is God's helping hand. You don't remove the hand. And if you study the Bible and you study the spirit of prophecy, the hand is the Holy Spirit. The hand is the Holy Spirit. The hand and the finger is the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you an example where we can find this. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5. You remember Belshazzar? He was drinking, getting drunk out of the cups of the sanctuary tabernacle. And it says they drank wine in verse 4 and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, wood, and of stone. Verse 5, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand. So here you have fingers of a man's hand. Well, let's go to Luke 11:20. Luke chapter 11 and verse 20. Luke 11 and verse 20. So fingers are connected to the hands of a man. It's the fingers that do the writing. Luke 11, 20, Jesus says, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So in Luke 11, 20, Jesus says, With the finger of God he casts out devils. Now let's go to the book of Matthew and let's see what Matthew says it is regarding the same subject. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. See, Matthew was a tax collector. He wasn't as detailed from top to bottom as Luke is. Luke's book gives even more detail. But let's see what Matthew says. Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So Matthew 12, 28 tells us this is the Spirit of God. Luke 11, 20 tells us this is the finger of God. And the finger of God comes from his hand. So it is the Holy Spirit that led in the making of this book by Uriah Smith. And we read in previous quotes, it was the Holy Spirit who led him in the writing of this book. Let's keep going. Aren't there major mistakes in Uriah's book? This is what people are saying. Aren't there major mistakes in Uriah's book? No. Go to 10 Manuscript Release, page 49, paragraph 1, 
to 50 paragraph one. I'm only going to show you two or three quotes, paragraphs from these two pages, but if you read the whole thing starting with paragraph one on page 49, you will see that the topic is about the large books by these pioneer men, specifically Uriah Smith's book. So let's see what the prophet says. In some of our important books that have been in print for years, once again, if you read page 49, paragraph 1, it's specifically dealing with Uriah's book. But she's saying this about overall of all of these large books written by these men, and which have been brought many to a knowledge of the truth. There may be found matters of minor importance that call for careful study and correction. Let not these brethren, nor our canvassers, nor our ministers, magnify these matters in such a way as to lessen the influence of these good soul-saving books. Should we take up the work of discrediting our literature, we would place weapons in the hands of those who have departed from the faith and confuse the minds of those who have newly embraced the message. The less that is done unnecessarily to change our publications, the better it will be. Manuscript Release, Volume 10. So, she says, in all of these books, there may be found matters of minor importance, not salvational issues, but minor importance that do call for careful study and correction, because we want to know the verses and quotes thoroughly, um, the verses thoroughly. But there may be things of minor importance that are not correct but it's not major salvational issues, okay? We're counseled that these minor things of minor importance are not to be magnified. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Uriah's book cannot have all these major errors that many are claiming. And we're going to be learning that as we go through this chapter. We're going to see what Haskell says. Does he endorse everything Uriah says in here? What about Lofbro? What about other writers? Okay? So we want to be careful, and there should not be change to our publications. Now we're going to continue on to see more about this. In 1910, she said changes were not to be made to this book. I have been instructed that the Lord is not the author of the proposal to make many changes in books already published. If information regarding this sort of work, even as regards the few instances, so she's talking about just a few, where revisions are needed should become widespread, seeds of doubt would spring up in many minds. Satan would be busy at work in planting seeds of distrust and unbelief, and it would require much labor to remedy the evil that would be wrought. Actually, it's the contrary today. More people have faith in the 1944 edition, but they don't realize there is an original edition that she endorses. Now, there are two editions that have been brought in since 1897, and the first one is the 1912 edition. The supposedly 1897 edition on the E.G. White CD-ROM is actually not the 1897 but the 1912 edition and you might ask well how do you know this the way to find this out is go to Uriah Smith's name in the pioneer section on the E.G. White CD-ROM if you don't have that CD-ROM I highly recommend you get it because pretty soon these books are going to be obsolete there's going to be a famine in the land you can get all her writings the majority of her writings and, and your uh, Pioneer Writings for $20. Contact your local Adventist Book Center or go online and find one that you can call and order from. Then click the name of the book, Daniel and the Revelation, on the CD-ROM under Uriah's name. Then click the table of contents. Then click chapter 12. Now scroll up four paragraphs above chapter 12 which would be the fourth from the last paragraph of chapter 1145. Okay? It mentions 1908, events that took place in 1908. How can this be the 1897 edition when it's mentioning things that happened in 1908? How can this be by Uriah Smith 
when he died in 1903. Remember that in 1910, the prophet said not to make these changes. What about the 1944 edition? This is what it looks like. This book has over 10,000 errors between all the omissions and additions. Many pages in this book are written on World Wars 1 and 2. How can this edition be by Uriah Smith when he died in 1903 and both wars were in 1914 and 1939? What they've done is taken out a lot of what he wrote in the original edition and added all of this stuff about World Wars 1 and 2 and all of these, uh, um, what would you call them, uh, um, what do you call it, um, you know like the Industrial Revolution and the 1900s and the Turning Point, um, technology, all of this technology, they've written a lot about the light bulb and different things in this book. Brothers and sisters, Uriah Smith died in 1903. How can he be writing all of this information that's after 1903? If they want us to have this information, they should have put it in another book with another name, not calling it the 1897, um, but calling it the 1912 or the 1944, which in this particular book, they do say it's 1944. But in 1910, Sister White said there wasn't to be all these changes made to this book. Everything Uriah wrote regarding the Eastern question has removed from this edition. And he wrote a lot. Everything he wrote on the Eastern question, and remember, she said great essential questions were in that book. The Eastern question is one of those essential questions. Another question subject that is in this book is the Sabbath question. You have the Sabbath question and the Eastern question. She said these were great, the, this book contained the great essential questions that all need to know and understand. Here's another copy of the 1944 book. I used to have both of these. And I was reading them. The purple ones seemed to be a little bit more hard to understand. But the brown one is very confusing. When you get the correct edition, which we'll be looking at in just a moment, it's much more clear. It's not, it's not mixed and scrambled, and it makes much sense compared to this particular book. I read that book a couple times, and I still didn't understand it. Here are the correct 1897 editions. Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. This is a purple book with the two candlesticks on the front and the open Bible. Here is Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. This particular one comes from Europe. And here is the third one, Daniel and the Revelation. Um, this one is by Light Bearers Ministry. Ty Gibson. But this one has a lot of typos in it and we'll be seeing where you can get the first and the third one because I can't find the link. I've, I misplaced the link where you can get the second one. And here is the um, link where you can actually read the correct edition online. This link is from Light Bearers Ministry, which is the book on the bottom right in brown and yellow. This book does have many typos, though. Misspelled words, correct, incorrect dates, not on major things, but on minor things. So where to purchase the correct editions? The bright purple book with the two candlesticks you can order from His Publishing Vine, 1945 Southwest Biltmore Street in Port St. Lucie, 34984. I don't really, I'm not affiliated with this gentleman, um, but I do purchase this book. Just be sure to let them know you're asking for the $50 special price, which includes the shipping and he will give it to you for that price. Otherwise, you're gonna pay 55 plus shipping and handling. The brown and yellow book, but has many typos. You can find it at this particular. But didn't Uriah fight against the prophet and her visions? Yes, 
from 1888 to 1891, he did. And you can read about it in the 1888 articles, page 714, paragraph 2, and 715, paragraph 1, to 716, paragraph 1. And while he was doing this at this time, she said it was dangerous for him to have a position because he would lead many astray because he was fighting against the testimonies and her visions. However, he repented. And you can read about this in three manuscript release, page 419, paragraph 1. But a lot of people don't tell you this part. They don't tell you Uriah repented. So I'm going to read to you what happened. Sunday, Elder Smith came to me, and we had a lengthy talk. I was encouraged to see that he did not brace against me, and I withheld nothing from him as to how I regarded his position and how hard he had made my work. He felt deeply over this. Tuesday, two days later, he called on me again and asked me to attend a meeting which should be composed of a select few. This meeting was held on Wednesday. Brother Smith read the matter I had written to him, and he made a straightforward confession to Professor Bell, who was present, of the manner in which he had treated him. Then he commenced with Minneapolis and made his confession. He had fallen on the rock and was broken. I cannot describe to you my joy. I know the Lord was in our midst. As we separated, Brother Smith took my hand and said, Sister White, will you forgive me for all the trouble and distress that I have caused you? I assure you this is the last time, if the Lord will pardon me. I will not repeat the history of the past three years. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, Sister White says. Bless his holy name. My return from Washington, D.C. to Battle Creek was indeed the Lord's doing. And as soon as I reached home, the affliction left my heart and has not returned since. This fighting against the testimonies was causing such stress to Sister White. She was having affliction in her heart. And when Uriah Smith asked for apology and truly repented and was on the rock, broken on the rock, Jesus Christ, Sister White rejoiced and the affliction of her heart went away. But this is history many people don't know of. They don't tell you Uriah repented. So from 1888 to 1891, Uriah fought against the visions. Um, as a matter of fact, he had repented so much that just one year prior to his death, in 1902, she said he should be the head editor. And if his vision should ever go bad, his son should write at his dictation. Now the head editor in 1902 was A.T. Jones. No, 1901 was A.T. Jones. And she was so happy to see Uriah's name back as the head editor. Remember in 1888 material, she said he shouldn't have a position. Now she wants him not only editor, but head editor. She says, I feel very tender toward Elder Smith. My life interest in the publishing work is bound up with his. He came to us as a young man possessing talents that qualified him to stand in his lot and place him as an editor. Place as an editor. How I rejoice as I read his articles in the review. So excellent. So full of spiritual truth. I thank God for them. I feel a strong sympathy for Elder Smith and I believe that his name should always appear in the review as the name of the leading editor. Thus God would have it. When some years ago his name was placed second, I felt hurt. When it was again placed first, I wept and said, Thank God. May it always be there, as God designs it shall be. While Elder Smith's right hand can hold a pen, and when the power of his hand fails, let his sons write at his dictation. Publishing Ministry, page 29, paragraph 1. I'm sorry, paragraph 5 to the top of page 30. And one last thing. Something people don't know about Uriah Smith. 
they say he wasn't in the message from the beginning but remember Uriah Smith had a mother named Rebecca for those of you who might not know and it says that Rebecca and her children including Uriah they had been in the message and they were waiting for Christ's second coming in 1844 they were in the first angel second angel and third angels message and when they were waiting for Christ Uriah was 12 years old remember sister white says she was 12 when she was baptized and she was 12 when she went to listen to Miller about the coming of Jesus 12 is the age of accountability 12 is the age that Christ was able to go into the temple so Uriah Smith knew these messages from a child he had gone away for a little time some of her children went away but they all came back so this is wonderful history for all of us to know the end any questions if so please ask in the comment section below this presentation so until we meet again brothers and sisters may the good Lord bless and keep each and every one of you we are going to be doing our verse by verse exposition on Daniel 11 you are not going to want to miss this it is going to be exciting because you're going to learn things that you had no idea we're going to be learning great history about Daniel chapter 11 things about Cleopatra Julius Caesar Mark Anthony fascinating histories of the past are all involved in Daniel chapter 11 Lord bless